please welcome Xamarin Forms lead engineer, Jason Smith. Good afternoon. So I'm Jason. I've been working on Xamarin Forms for quite a while now. Uh, a lot of you know me. And a lot of you are going to get to know me today. Uh, we're going to be talking a little bit about making Xamarin Forms as fast as it can be. And uh, I've been in an interesting position for the past three years. I've had the opportunity to see thousands of apps, to see the source code to thousands of apps. And over that time, I've noticed quite a few uh, patterns, different things that people do that are subtly hurting the performance of their app. And I want that to stop. <laughs> because it hurts me and it hurts you. So we're going to discuss those patterns. And we're going to talk about what you should do instead. And uh, we're going to start by saying one very simple truth. Performance is hard. There's no such thing as a free win for performance. Uh, it comes in a thousand little paper cuts. And when you add up all the little tips and tricks, you'll shave off 10, 15 milliseconds. And then you do a couple more things. And finally, your app is actually fluid and smooth and 60 frames a second, because that's the goal. The goal is that your app should be 60 frames a second on every animation, every transition, everything it does. And not only is performance hard, but your app is really going to be judged by it. It's going to hit you in the App Store. And it's going to hit you in your users' hearts. They're really going to care if your app has a delay when it goes to a new page. They're going to care if your animation doesn't play correctly because it's doing something silly on the UI thread. Um, but there are some things to bear in mind here. Like I said, most of these tips, they're going to be small little paper cuts, uh, a millisecond or so here and there. And that's how you win this, a millisecond at a time many, many times. But you do enough of these, you're going to get it right. However, that said, there are some things I can't save you from. If you have too many views on screen, it's going to be slow. So you have to worry about the uh, UX. You don't have a desktop processor in these mobile phones. It's not that fast. <laughs> They're getting better, though. Um, and worse, most of your user's hardware kind of sucks. It's going to be slow, older phones. It's not going to be the Nexus 6P that you know, costs, what, 400 bucks now, 500 bucks? I don't know. Um, they're going to have mid-range or low-end phones for the most part, and you need to perform there as well. So there are some easy things you can do. And these are things that you should be able to go home right now and turn on in your app and get some free wins. The very first in Xamarin Forms is to enable XAML C. Does, do you guys use uh, XAML in your apps? Are you guys that are using XAML turning on the XAML compilation? Do you guys know how to turn on the XAML compilation? <laughs> um, it's pretty easy. We have good docs on it. It's just an attribute you put in the, uh, I should have had a slide on this. It's just an attribute you put in the uh, top of your uh, assembly info.cs, and you can turn it on globally. Definitely turn that on. Um, also, uh, a lot of people use bindings. I'm sure almost everybody who's used Emerald Forms before uses bindings. Uh, by the way, I forgot to ask, how many of you guys have used Emerald Forms before? Pretty much everybody. Great, because I told them when I was going to do this talk that I was going to assume that. <laughs> um, if you haven't used Emerald Forms before, I hope it's not too confusing. <laughs> Um, but we'll do what we can. Um, so don't bind things that can be set statically. Leave your default values alone. Every time you set a default value, it's a performance hit, even though you're setting it to what it already was. Um, be aware of what layouts you're using. Don't use a stack layout to host a single child. Don't use a grid when, when a stack layout would do. And don't use multiple stack layouts when a grid would do. Don't use transparency if you don't need it. Overlaying a black semi-transparent box on top of a white background is a lot slower than overlaying a gray box that's opaque. 
Uh, and use async await when you can, because blocking the main thread sucks. There's plenty of talks on that. This is a uh, sample I pulled out of a user's app and simplified a little bit. Uh, it really made me go, what? And the reason is that they packed everything into a content view for no real gain, because they weren't aware of the power of the layout system. And so what they should have done is something that looks more like this. This produces the exact same layout, removes three views and one level of hierarchy. Um, and we're just going to use the padding property on the stack layout itself. So being aware of the power of the layout system is very important because you can reduce the nesting of your app, which is really going to improve your overall performance. Uh, there are some other things. Uh, I'm sure all of you have seen layout options. Yes? Have you, does anybody here in the audience, other than me, know what layout options.fill is and what the difference is between fill and fill and expand? <laughs> yeah, that's what I thought. <laughs> um, Here's, here's the honest truth. Unless you're using a stack layout, you want fill. If you are using a stack layout, fill and expand, maybe. Um, don't touch them 99% of the time. They're probably what you already want. Um, when you're using a grid, for the love of God, stop making everything an auto column and row. If you can get away with stars, do it. It's like orders of magnitude faster. And whatever you do, 12 stack layouts do not make a grid. <laughs> so, you know, use the grid in that case. Uh, also, if you can get away with it, don't use relative layout at all. Um, it has a very expensive, a very high cyclomatic complexity. You kind of don't want to go there. I know I'm kind of the guy who wrote that and all, but. Uh, when you're talking about labels, measuring text is expensive. Fewer labels are better. Use the spans. Uh, turn off wrapping. It's even faster. And uh, use the, don't use the vertical text alignment unless you need to. The default vertical text alignment cuts out an entire measurement cycle that you would otherwise need. Um, also, try to update them minimally. Or and if you do have to update them, update them all at once, uh, because those update cycles are expensive, but we do queue them all up together if you do it all at once. Big mistake I see a lot is not packing children of a view before you pack their parents into the visual hierarchy. So I'm going to show you what this is. This is uh, an example of it being done wrong. Here we have four views, a page, a stack layout, an image, and a label. And what we're going to see is that we're going to pack this stack layout into the content of the page before we add its children. Now, the thing that happens is the moment you add that stack layout to the visual hierarchy, that stack layout is being realized, it's being measured, it's being rendered, and then you're going to add stuff to it, which is going to invalidate the measurements, invalidate the rendering, and it's all going to happen over again. So if all we do is change the order in which that's done, right? Now it all happens before it gets visualized, and we don't pay those extra performance costs. And this is a really easy win. You can shave. I, I, I literally cut a second off a guy's screen transition time just by doing this. Um, it's, a, it's a big win. Uh, another example I've seen where somebody's doing it wrong, and again, we can reorder this. Uh, Sorry. Another place that you can do this wrong that's a little more subtle is if you use the on appearing event. So a lot of people pack views in the on appearing event uh, because this is normal in UI kit and iOS. Um, it's not called on appearing there, but you know you get the idea. Um, and the better approach here is to actually do it right in the constructor of your page. Xamarin Forms is just going to create these tiny little objects. They're pretty cheap. The expensive objects are created when we realize the renderers. So that's all going to happen at the same time, pretty much no matter what. But this way, you don't pay an extra layout cycle or two cost. It's a, it's again, it's a simple win. 
for the love of everything, please stop putting list views inside of scroll views. I've seen this so many times, I don't know what to say. It breaks virtualization. It's completely unnecessary. And it will mean that when you rotate your app, it'll sit there for about five minutes and then finally rotate later. Um, if instead what you do is you use the header and footer properties to add the content above or below the list view, which is 99% of the time what people want, uh, you're going to get a much better result. You guys mind if I sit down? My leg's been kind of hurting me. Ugh. Let's talk about list views. List views are great. I love list views. They're virtualized. They perform well. They're easy to use, in my opinion. I mean, I wrote the API, so I know it. Um, that said, uh, table views exist. Please stop using table views. Uh, use uh, instead list views with a data template selector. Uh, in the future, hopefully, if we're really lucky, table views will just go away. Um, obviously, we'll provide a back compat package if we do that, but that'd be nice. Also, use the new caching strategy that we provide on list views for recycling cells. This is far more efficient than the old caching strategy, uh, which is still the default because we didn't want to break users' apps. Uh, so you have to enable that by hand, but please do so because you'll really gain from it. Uh, further, uh, we've seen a lot of people overriding the on binding context changed property, which, again, should have had a slide for. <laughs> And uh, they update their layouts in there. Please don't do that. Use the data template selectors. They're new in 2.1, 2.0. I don't know. Rui, who's in the front, will tell me in a minute. When did data template selectors come in? 2.1. Uh, and lastly, I know that we accept an I enumerable as your item source in the list view. Please give us a list instead. Um, the I enumerable will work, and you can you know, generate some link and pass it in there. But there's a lot of overhead when you do that. With an I list, we get random access. It's a lot more efficient. So try to convert to an I list, if at all possible. Uh, when you have a na navigation page, you must await the push and pop async methods. If you don't, not only are you possibly getting serious performance issues, you're actually quite likely breaking your app. Um, and do not hide and unhide the nav bar too frequently on a, on a page. Do it when you need to, uh, not, you know, I saw one guy that was doing it like every second. It was quite an amazing app. <laughs> carousel page is fun, and I'm sure I'm going to get some questions about this at the end. Uh, don't use carousel page. <laughs> carousel page is our deep, dark shame. Instead, you should use the new shiny carousel view, which we're in the process of stabilizing. It will be out in a pre-release package this week. Um, carousel view is everything carousel page is not. It's embeddable. It's virtualized. It's faster. Um, so you know, use carousel view. Also, I want to make sure you are all aware of some really nice properties here that you may not know about. Grid row spacing and column spacing can save you from adding extra columns and rows to your grid that you wouldn't otherwise need. Same thing with stack layout spacing can save you from putting in transparent box views. Um, the label has a vertical and horizontal text alignment, which are similar to vertical and horizontal options. However, they're fast. <laughs> um, and we also have a translation x and translation y property. And the translation x and translation y properties are post layout transforms that you can apply to a view. And if you use these properties, you don't have to call layout on the child to move it around. So if you're animating a view across the screen, these translation properties are far more efficient. While we're at talking about layout, Stop calling layout, especially the force layout method. Uh, force layout is very expensive. 
and you almost certainly meant to use the translation x and translation y properties. And if you do want to call a layout, you should do it by doing a custom layout. Has anybody here ever written a custom layout? One guy, two guy, three guy, four. Yeah. So next year, when I give a talk, I'm going to ask the same question. And I'm hoping to see like 20% of the hands go up. Custom layouts are really easy to make. I have a talk on them later this week. No, tomorrow, which is later this week. Um, and they will save you a lot of time and headache and performance. So use custom layouts. When you use the messaging center, uh, first off, if you can, use something like Prism. Uh, Brian Lagunas did a great talk earlier this week on Prism. It's a fantastic framework. Uh, but if you are just going to use the messaging center for your message passing, please pass it either a static or an instance method. And whatever you do, don't pass it a Lambda expression, especially if that Lambda generates a closure. You'll almost certainly leak that memory. Uh, one thing we see a lot is on Android, images don't downsample. That is just the nature of the Android images on Xamarin Forms. It's a current limitation. So it is up to you to do the downsampling on your server or to downsample them before you ship them with the device. And Android kind of has like a performance cliff with image size. It's fine, 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 and then two frames a second. Uh, there is an image is opaque property as well. If your image is not transparent, set that to true. It will improve performance ever so slightly. Um, and you should load your images from content and not from resources, because the load time is slightly faster. Uh, we have these bindable properties. If you're making your own, uh, be sure not to. Am I on time? Oh, we're good. Uh, be sure not to use the generic versions of the create, especially the ones that use the the uh, what are they called? Expressions. Uh, they were very popular. We were recommending them early on. It turns out that the end result of doing that is your iOS app will be inflated by potentially several megabytes. Not that great. Instead, use the string-based variant and use the C# -sharp 6 name of operator, so you get nice clean refactoring. It's very nice. This is another one we see happen a lot. Scroll view and stack layout are not a list view. They're not even close to the same thing. There's no virtualization when you do this. There's huge performance implications when you do this. So please, please stop. By the way, I want to say, I've seen thousands of apps, and most of them don't do these things. Most of them are fantastic. You guys are so, so great at using our APIs. All right, let's talk about some advanced things, some things that you probably didn't know you could do. You can actually inflate your views on a thread. You can't add them to the visual tree, but you can inflate them on a thread. So if you have a page that takes a long time to run its constructor, you can fire that off in a background thread, inflate the whole thing, and return it back to the main thread for adding into the UI. But there are some limitations to this. First, like I just said, you can't add it to the visual tree. And second, you have to be very careful about messaging. There is no automatic marshalling of threaded creation or threaded events in the messaging center. Uh, so if you do use messaging in your constructor of your background inflated view, you must do the marshalling yourself. And the other thing I want to make sure I cover is writing your own layout. It's just plain simpler a lot of the time. If you find yourself using the absolute layout, you're probably a prime candidate for doing this. Uh, and when should you do this in particular? Uh, basically, if you have a situation where you can go to your coworker and you can say, this is the layout I want, you can describe it, get it in their head, and it's pretty easy to describe in English, but you're having a very hard time describing it in the layouts we've given you. Uh, you're a prime candidate for a custom layout. 
If absolute layout is almost doing what you want, but not quite there, again, you're a prime candidate. Or lastly, if you really just need it to be as fast as humanly possible, you know things about your layout that we contextually don't in the framework, so you can short circuit a lot of the math. There are some basics, and we're going to go over this in depth in my next talk. And we're going to actually live code it. So, you know, that'll be a lot of fun. Hopefully, we'll see me screw that up a little bit. Uh, but basically, you have to override on size request, layout children, and layout child into bounding region. And those are the three methods. They're really easy to implement, they each do different things. Uh, the, the first two are measurements, and the last one is the one you call to actually perform the layout. So I know we did a lot of announcements in the keynote, and I don't have any talks on those. So I wanted to make this talk a little shorter so that we can spend a little bit of time doing questions and answers, because I'm sure there's quite a few. Um, so are there any questions? I'm sorry, can you wait for the microphone? Yes, sir. If you're trying to do layering, and so we're not trying to use the relative layout, how do you accomplish layering of images or a view to create an overlay? It seems like relative layout has always been that way of bringing something in front of something else. Yeah, so let's see if we can't. Uh, I'll fire up my ID while I talk. And uh, maybe in the future, then I'll have that ready for some other questions. But the, the best way to do layering is to actually just create a grid and add a bunch of things to it. It will automatically stack them on top of each other in the order in which you add them. It's a lot cheaper than relative layout for doing that. Um, you talked about uh, putting your fully done stacked view into your content view after. Yes. Words. What does uh, using XAML do? It does that. XAML is smart enough to do everything in the right order. Uh, so you want, when it comes to XAML, the only thing it's not smart enough to do is understand when you are packing things manually in like callbacks and handlers and stuff. So you need to be careful there. But the entire XAML engine does pack from uh, most derived child to uh, root. With the um, introduction of the XAML preview, is that kind of writing on the wall that some of us that do code should start maybe immersing ourselves and using XAML? I'm sorry. Uh, I believe what you're asking is with the introduction of the XAML previewer, does that mean that those of you who have been writing your UIs in code should start looking more heavily into XAML? Correct. Uh, well, as a personal level, I am uh, very much a, a lover of writing things in code. Uh, that's just my personal preference. Uh, that said, kind of, yeah, I mean, it's a lot faster. <laughs> uh, the XAML is really neat. Uh, but I also want to mention that with the XAML compilation flags you can set now in Xamarin Forms, uh, the performance really is a lot better now. Is, is there any chance that uh, some of these great performance tips will make, that, uh, make their way into static analysis in the IDE? Yeah, so I actually got asked that by a gentleman at the conference earlier. And um, so we're a small team right now, uh, but I hope the answer is yes. I can't say for sure. I just don't have a good answer to that. Hi. Uh, we are trying to use uh, nested list views. Um, basically, you know, we have an expander kind of a situation on tap of a row. Right. And when we try to expand the row and uh, embed another list view inside a row, the app keeps crashing sometimes. So what's your take on that? My take on that is that there's a grouping option in list views. And I'm guessing that 
for whatever reason, that doesn't work for you. Um, and yeah, nesting list views is explicitly not supported in the documentation. It breaks virtualization in quite a few ways. And you'll get pretty nasty performance out of it, not to mention a fair amount of potential for crashing. Uh, that said, what I would suggest, and what I think is probably the best option for you, is to write a custom renderer to actually address the native API, which is always the power of forms, and use that to uh, create your control. Jason, having made a sizable investment once upon a time in your carousel page, when is your carousel view ready? Well, the are going to be ready. <laughs> the answer to that is as soon as it works to the quality standard we want. But uh, we already had a pre-release with it in it. Uh, unfortunately, for the stable release of 2.2, we decided it wasn't up to the quality standards that we wanted the Carousel View to be at. So we're going to be continuing to develop it in its own package as a pre-release as we stabilize it and further improve it. Um, it will be open sourced uh, sometime soon uh, for community contribution as well. Uh, but you should be able to start using it uh, as soon as we put that package out sometime this week. Uh, we use a lot of um, custom cells in the list view. And um, I haven't been able to find an elegant way. If I have a, a multi-line label, and I don't know how long it's going to be, I need to request the height of the custom cell to be a certain thing. And I have to go and write custom code for each platform to figure out the size of the text. Is there any way to do it in a more elegant way in Xamarin Forms? Does it make sense? Uh I'm sorry, can you describe the exact situation one more time? OK, we use a lot of custom cells right. in list views. The custom cells contain a multi-line labels. Okay. And the size of the text that goes into that label is obviously coming from the database somewhere. It could be long, could be shorter. Yep. So um, the, the cells, we want the cell sizes to be dynamic based on the size of the text. And right now, in order to do that, I can request the size of the custom cell to be x. But in order to know what that x is, I have to go and look, uh, do some platform-specific code for iOS and then for Android to figure out what the size of that text is going to be for that label. Is there a better way to do it? So the custom renderers you write, that anyone writes, if they don't implement the measure spec on the native platform correctly, uh, you'll end up in a situation like this where you have to write custom code to make it work. Well, we're not writing custom renderers. We're writing custom oh, cells. Oh, you're writing a view cell. Right, view have cell. Have you tried setting has uneven rows equals true? I did, but um, the size of the label still is fixed. Hmm. So uh, it, it, just go, it just cuts the text oh, if, is, if it's not big, if it's not uh, the label tall enough. Is the content being loaded dynamically? Yeah. Yeah, OK. So that's your problem. There's a method force update cell size or something like that. I don't remember it off the top of my head exactly. Um, that once your content loads, you can call, which will trigger the visual to update. What, what is it called again? Force update size. OK. We didn't, we didn't make cells automatically resize because the performance implications of that is quite large. And we wanted users to have to explicitly opt into that. Thank you. Hi, Jason. Hi. Um, I, I have a question that you, maybe you get all the time, probably a couple of times a day. Um, will there be a? In the beginning, I couldn't hear that at all. I was, um, you probably get this question a lot, because I actually get it a lot from other people asking me. Um, will there be a designer, a visual de sort of a drag and drop designer for Xamarin Forms? Um, <laughs> well, it's time for the political answer. Uh, <laughs> we always do things that we think delight developers the best. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you. That said, that's not a yes or a no. Uh, uh, Jason, this side. Uh, first off, thank you very much for creating forms. We have been uh, using it pretty heavily now. 
two questions. One is related to the announcement made today, the preview. Yeah. Uh, is it an interactive preview? Will it work on devices only, or, or it's just a you know static preview? You still have to change everything is ML. Would I be able to click on a button and then see the button pressed color also changing? You know, if I have a behavior or effect in place. So uh, the live the live preview is static currently, and I I have no idea if that's uh, intended to change. Yeah. And uh, is it uh, going to work on that design shell only, or will it also work with the devices? I mean, can I also see it on device library? I do not believe the current intention is to make it work with devices. Second question is more important. Um, oh, by the way, I should say something. There are guys out there, uh, they have a booth, UX Divers. And they have this thing called Gorilla Player, which is yeah. absolutely fantastic and does live preview on devices. Yeah, I've been using Gorilla Player now so yeah. for a long time before this was it. So um, uh, my second question is, uh, any plans roadmap down the line to introduce the margin property, just like it was in? You mean like in 2.2? <laughs> what was that? <laughs> yeah, the stable release that went out today has margins. Is it? Yes, absolutely. Oh, that's, that's fantastic. Oh, man. I totally forgot to mention this in the slides. Uh, yeah, if you have a content view with padding with a child so that you can emulate margins, stop doing that now. Use margins. It's way faster, like orders of magnitude faster. I a, is this on? Yeah, I had a question specifically about page to page transitions. Is there any current way to do custom transitions page to page, or would you consider that kind of a not currently feasible kind of thing? It's actually feasible, and the way you do it is using the effects API. Have you taken any look into that? A little bit. OK, so with an effect, you can then get into that platform-specific code and modify those transitions. Uh, we've started looking at making sure that this is more addressable on Android and iOS and UWP. And in the future, we're going to uh, be adding kind of interfaces you can tack onto your effects to to make that even easier. But right now, it's possible. It just takes a little bit of custom code. OK. And follow-up question to that. Um, can you name any what you would consider roadblocks from using Xamarin Forms? An example, say you have a client that says they want to use Xamarin Forms, but they don't want to limit themselves. So they want to be able to support Android Wear, Apple Watch, Apple Pay, Google Pay. They want to be able to support all this crap, health kit, all of this. Are there? Any of those that you would consider to be limitations or known roadblocks for not using Xamarin Forms to kind of keep in mind? Well, the biggest limitations are going to be things like, you know, obviously Xamarin Forms doesn't address Apple Wear or uh, Android Wear or the Apple Watch. Um, and it currently doesn't have any support for writing apps there. There are other limitations. If, if your user interface doesn't look the same, or si not the same, doesn't look similar in terms of layout and functionality on each of the different platforms, you're probably not a good target for Xamarin Forms it, if you have wildly you know, differing ideas of what it should look like. Also, if you have just crazy amounts of animation and customization and blurs, and right, uh, there's a reason Xamarin provides a native toolkit. Yes, it's just it's the way I've always just described it as there's kind of like a uh, difficulty versus ease of implementation curve of you know when you're doing things native, it's kind of a linear. The harder your app, the harder it is to implement. With Xamarin Forms, it kind of goes, you know, it's much flatter at the beginning. But as your app gets more and more and more complicated, it starts curving upwards. And eventually, those two curves cross. And if you're kind of up in that upper right quadrant of difficulty, Xamarin Forms isn't for you. Um, we have a app that has a fairly deep navigation hierarchy and have been running into out of memory um, exceptions, especially on Android. Are there any suggestions on how to get around that? Are you using the app compat backend yet? No, not yet. Okay, so that has a huge performance improvement for that particular scenario. Essentially, the old backend, everything in your back stack stayed in memory. Now it uses fragments and it won't. Um, I, I might be missing something, but I was just wondering, um, are there any suggestion for an elegant solution to having fonts that resize automatically? 
No, I know it's it's on our to-do list. <laughs> okay. Right. Yeah, it's a, it's a big and important feature that's not done. Okay. Um, I have a question on the navigation. So uh, we're trying to uh, pop up a screen which is parent, uh, transparent and want it to see some of the uh, content okay. over the, the existing content. Yeah. So uh, currently, we can't get it to work. So every time we pop up a transparent view, it always has a, a white background. So I wonder if there is something we can do to address that. I really think I would need to see it. Um, you should find me after the talk, and, and we'll look at it in person. OK. Thank you. Hi, sorry. Um, wow. Uh, so, pretty new to uh, Xamarin Forms myself, so sorry if this is a very new question, but I am interested in the uh, best practices uh, for like handling uh, custom user touch interfaces and stuff like that, or um, image manipulation. Yes, yeah, so you're talking about, in particular, capturing like multi-touch? Yes. Yeah, so you really have to dig that down into the renderer API pull that out. We have gesture support, but not raw touch event support. Um, and that's a limitation of the platform. Uh, you can get down into the renderers and write a custom renderer and grab that data out. And I've definitely seen it done. Um, but you, know, you have to make a decision there on whether or not you want to do that as a native control that you then embed, or do it as a uh, custom renderer for an existing control. Uh, I'm sorry, um, you need a microphone if oh. you're going to. I'm sorry, um, I did fit in a second question there, sorry. So um, custom image manipulation, is there any sort of functionality or support for that? Oh, you mean like uh, actually modifying an image, applying a filter or things like that? There's nothing like that in Forms. Uh, there might be a plugin I've seen, but it's done through a, a Platform-specific dependency-injected services. There are a variety of NVVM packages out there, uh, Prism Cross, Fresh, et cetera. Is there one of them you recommend, and for any particular reason? <clears throat> um, so I'm going to, again, have to give a semi-political answer here. Uh, there are a lot of really great options out there. And uh, I'll say that the MVVM Lite, MVVM Cross, and Prism guys are all fantastic and wonderful. The Prism guys, in particular, work with us very closely and are continuing to help adapt their toolkit specifically to have features for forms and support for incredible things like URL navigation, which uh, Brian gave a talk on. So if you didn't see that, uh, he has a, there should be a video up sometime about it. Um, so yeah, uh, right now, I kind of lean Prism, but that's just my personal choice. MVVM Lite and MVVM Cross are both fantastic frameworks. And there are other ones out there that are really nice as well. Hi. Can you talk about the new uh, data pages performance-wise compared to list views or whatnot? What's in, what's in it for, for us? What's in data pages? Data pages come with a couple really neat things. First off. Data pages are really just high-level controls. They're something higher level than in a label. They're a hero image, or a list page, or a list data page, which has a master detail kind of setup, which is different from our master detail page, which should have been called flyout page. But uh, yeah. Um, so performance-wise, they're the same. In fact. Uh, under the hood, there's nothing special about them. They're just control templated pages like you can use in Xamarin Forms now. Uh, and they have a special property on them called a data source. And the data source is used to provide quick and easy introduction of data into your app for the purpose of uh, scaffolding out your UI very rapidly. And then the idea is as you develop, you slowly stop using the data source as you start building your view models and building a proper MVVM app that you're actually going to be wanting to ship. The, the long-term plan is not to ship data sources in your app. It's to get it so that you can have 
a team that's working on the UI and making that beautiful and fantastic, and a team that's working on the view models and the models and making those stable and functional, and that you can have both those things going at the same time. And also, as a side bonus of this, because you have these higher level concepts, the themes know about them and can apply beautiful theming to them. I hope that answers your question. Hey, Jason. Uh, I had a question. Um, are you having any plans to support forms on Xamarin Mac? And secondly, do you have plans on converging UWP XAML with form XAML? <laughs> um, so first, the Mac question. Uh, do we have plans? We're not opposed to it. We're open source. And uh, if somebody were to come along and write a specification for how that should be done, we would definitely help and contribute and usher that in. And there's nothing that would stop us from doing that. Uh, at this time, we are not, as far as I know, planning on dedicating discrete engineering effort to it. Um, but there are multiple people I've talked to at this event that have expressed interest in it. So I don't know. That may change in the future. Uh, the second question was about unifying UWP XAML and Xamarin Form XAML. At this time, there are no plans to unify. However, that said, there are intentions to at least look at what we can do to make UWP developers more comfortable and, and understand better. So if there was a way that we could better support UWP developers by having them stay in a more natural namespace for themselves without breaking backwards compatibility with existing apps and existing users, we would strongly consider it. So some things are easy enough to do that way. Some things maybe not. So we'll look into it. Um, and obviously, we're open source, so. All right, so um, we saw over here. I can't. Oh, we saw during the keynote the new feature of adding native controls directly to Xamarin Inform pages. Yeah. And I was wondering, what's the pattern of usage for this? Where, where is the place where we would call this code? Is it in the page render, or what's the, the It can go anywhere in the platform-specific head or the platform-specific app. Um, it doesn't have to be in the page renderer. Uh, a lot of people will put it in their app delegate, for example, on iOS. Uh, it, it just can't be in the PCL because you don't have access to the UI kit or Android widget objects there. So any pattern you would recommend? Uh, the pattern I see used the most is, is people do it right in the, the app delegate or the main activity after they call, uh, after they new up the app, but before they call load application. So it's kind of like in between those two things. You new the thing up, you pack it in, and away you go. All right, so revisiting relative layout. Um, yeah. I got a lot of stuff that starts off the view and then animates in, or off screen and animates in. So do you recommend using just uh, during the constructor using the translate x, translate y with a negative offset? Yes. It's significantly more efficient. Uh, orders of magnitude. Uh, Jason. First is, uh, I'm thankful that we are in a bigger room than last ever. I could at least break. Sorry, I. I... Uh, I'm thankful that we are in a bigger room this year than last year, last ever. Well, at least you don't all have to sit on the floor this time. <laughs> <laughs> Second is, uh, with the introduction of UWP projects, uh, I'm not able to. Uh, test whether the Windows app is a UWP or RT or a Windows phone or anything. So uh, do you have any proposal for those emulation? Uh... Yeah, so actually, that's a really great question. Uh, there were some API design mistakes we made around the way you test what platform you're on, uh, namely, we couldn't change it without breaking backwards compatibility in both an API and an ABI sense. So we were 
limited on how we could represent UWP in that particular enumeration. Um, we are currently trying to evaluate uh, a better alternative for this. Change stand up. However, we will be uh, soliciting feedback from the community as we put that spec together. Uh, so please, you know, stop by the GitHub once we get all those specs posted up and leave your feedback, comments, whatever you got. Hello, here. Um, so we're using on our current application. We have a table view that we use. Yeah. And in the table view, we insert our custom cells to to mimic a settings view of a phone using Xamarin Forms. Yeah. So we ran into an issue where the view cell was crashing on the is enabled property on the iOS. Yeah. But not on the Android. So we reported that, and it's being fixed supposedly in 2.3. Uh, okay. But we are in 2.0, I can't think right now. So we are having that issue now, and we don't want to wait until the 2.3 release. So is it better for us to replace that table view with the list view and use the custom cells, or how would you recommend we go about it? Two paths forward. One, replace the table view with a list view. I always love that. Um, however, settings pages are the one weird exception that I didn't mention to the table view. Uh, stop using it, please, bit, which is that settings pages almost always have a unique cell for each different element, uh, in which case table views make a certain amount of sense, which is why we haven't removed them yet, because the list view needs to be extended to support that functionality with much more ease. Uh, so the other way forward is you contact whoever your sales rep is and request us to backport that particular bug fix for you, and hopefully they'll get that approved for you. Thank you. This, there we go. Uh, hi, so I came across an issue where uh, in custom renders, if any sort of exception or something is thrown, it actually, you, you don't see it. It kind of gets swallowed up. And then you know, mysterious behavior happens in your navigation. <laughs> uh, is there, are there any plans to address that or workarounds that you know about? So that is entirely caused by failing to await something that's further up the stack, and then your exceptions get swallowed. OK. So check your methods that are async that you're not awaiting. And it, once you add the await word to them, it will almost certainly start populating those errors up to you. OK. I'll double check. <laughs> Um, I think we're getting pretty close to time here. So maybe one more. What? That's it? All right. Thank you so much, guys.